Angelica J85 said, who have you been most nervous about interviewing? Jenny Fry. <laughs> no, only, only President Obama. Oh, we, no big deal. Oh, only, yeah. only, only. <laughs> no big deal. The NBA playoffs are here, and you'll be in hoops heaven betting all the action on FanDuel Sportsbook. There are so many exciting matchups, and FanDuel is taking that excitement to a whole nother level. Because new and existing users, all customers can bet risk-free throughout the playoffs. Once you have a FanDuel Sportsbook account, you can bet one same-game parlay risk-free every week. That means you can combine multiple bets for an even bigger win. And if you don't win, you'll get up to $10 back. And this week, I'm going to flip the script with my bet. And how about leaning into a full CP3 redemption tour, if you will? Sun's currently up 3-1 in the Western Conference Finals. How about a Chris Paul Finals MVP at plus 410? Hard to argue with it the way the Suns are playing, large in part because of CP3 himself. Basketball fans, now is the perfect time to give FanDuel a shot. New Year'sers can still get up to $1,000 back if your first bet doesn't win. Just sign up with the promo code ROADTRIPPIN to bet the NBA playoffs risk-free. That's code ROADTRIPPIN, exclusively on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Disclaimer, 21 and older and present in New Jersey, risk-free bet for the first online real money wager only and refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Same game parlay refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund, $10. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay available for multiple sports in all states on mobile backslash web. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. This episode is brought to you by Starbucks Triple Shot Energy. Extra strength coffee beverage in a can. That's Starbucks coffee that you love, ready to drink, offered in classic flavors and now in zero sugar. They have four core flavors, vanilla, dark roast, cafe mocha, which is my personal favorite, and caramel. Are you a caramel or is it caramel? Who knows? They are both zero sugar and dairy free. What gives you energy? Find your Starbucks triple shot energy online or at your local store. Cheers. This Channing is drinking. Cheers. Welcome into this edition of Road Trip and presented by FanDuel. I'm your host, Ali Clifton, alongside Richard Jefferson, Channing Fry. But none of us really matter. And our guest does not need any introduction. Um, she is, I say it all the time, the GOAT. She's my favorite broadcaster. Um, and she's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We welcome in Doris Burke. Yeah, Doris, welcome to the So good day. to be here. with the shirt today, Richard? If, if What'd you say? If it were a little later, guys, I would imbibe as well because I'm never one to pass on a glass of wine. Oh, <laughs> that, just, that just that just means next time. That all that means is next time, next time, next time. and you'll you'll have the Camus wines with you. So next and time, like you be... don't worry about it. We're gonna we're gonna, oh. take, we're gonna put a little package together for you, Doris. You can't have you going out there. You can't be thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Channing, Channing, what, what is Channing wearing? He looks like he's about to no, give it's a, like a, key, it's a, black a keynote, uh, like a keynote speaker, right? Like you're about <laughs> to, so with the glasses and the yeah, it looks like he's like, hold on, I'm just gonna do it. It's a it's a hoodie, right? Like a black Steve Jobs. Oh, it's tight. <laughs> hey, Doris, you oh. have covered Doris, you have covered so many athletes. Um how would you characterize these two within the first like three minutes of this episode that is about you? We're talking about what Channing's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I remember, I think the first time I might have talked to Richard was actually when he was with the Spurs. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. You might have been, you might have been the only person that talked to me then before I oh, like years. You know, it's funny, you were in, it's weird what you remember, like certain moments. Like I remember the first time I saw Chris Mullen, he was in a state of undress in the Indiana Pacers locker room. And I'm like, I really don't want to be here, <laughs> but, but whatever. <laughs> but you were engaged in a conversation with Tim Duncan and I didn't want to interrupt you. I, I always, and Ali, I don't know how you feel about this, but like locker rooms, I wish we could do our jobs elsewhere. Because as a former player, like that was our, that was our space. That was our, you know, place where you laughed till your stomach hurt, or you cried, or you were bitching about the coaches, or whatever you might have been doing. <laughs> um, so I've always wished we could we could be elsewhere to do our jobs as reporters. That's for sure. Do you so, think those Zoom things will carry over? Do you think like having like like the the little Zoom calls and just you know 
Because I, I agree. I actually agree with you. I, I, I think that doing like the Zoom calls for the guys that that are requested, and then um, either like a post game one on one or a shoot around or something. I think having you know tons of media flock into you know the locker rooms where guys are still getting dressed, getting treatment. You know, you might be trying to shield an injury or a limp from people. Like those are things that like go a long way as far as strategy. Do you think that that would carry over? You know, it's a great question. I think though all of those things are unanswered. You know, are we going to call certain games from home next season? How does the NBA feel about that? What's what's how will that play out? I don't know. I will say this to you, and and Ali, you could probably add to this. One thing I noticed that's different for me that's made my job more challenging, guys, is there's so many casual conversations I might be able to have with a player, with an assistant coach um, standing courtside where it might be just literally a minute or two minute interaction, but I might be told something that I can either use or have in my back pocket, or maybe they would say, Hey, I don't really want you to use this, but the knowledge still helps me to function in my job. And I can't do it the way, you know, you do it, right? Like you've played in the league, you both of you have played in the league. You understand different coaches. I, I have to do my job a little differently than you or Jeff or Mark. And so those small interactions with you guys have helped me so much over the years. Plus, it's just like the personal side of it. How are you doing? How is your family? You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That I, because you guys are people, first and foremost, as fans, I think we can we can overlook that. We see you sort of as superhuman people who do these incredible things between the lines when in actuality, you know, you have problems and challenges and go through bouts of maybe lacking confidence and, and those face-to-face -face interactions give you so much that I miss. I just miss all of it. Doris, when did you realize like, dude, I'm here. Like I'm fucking here <laughs> and I got like, and I'm not, I'm not like on the lower, the lower ring anymore. Like, you know, there's a, there's a respect thing. And like, I've seen a lot, obviously I'm on the Turner side. So like, there's a different vibe when like Ernie, Shaq and Charles move around, right? Then like when the new guys come, they're like, man, get your shit and get the fuck out of here. But like, <laughs> you know, when Shaq and Charles come, everyone's like, uh, okay, what are they, you know, everyone just kind of like tries to pick their brain or just be around them because most of the time they're, how they are on TV is how they argue in the back, the whole game, the whole game. And it just, there's like, take this over there for 20 minutes and then come back. But like, when did you say like, damn, okay, I'm getting like mad respect from people that I look up to. When did that happen? I would say, Chang, that's been a process and there've been a little, uh, little moments along the way that have really like helped me with my confidence because I'm gonna tell you the truth. Like I still go into every NBA game with a little bit of anxiety, you know, I don't want to fuck up. That's the truth. I don't. I'm really, I don't. Um, and I think that's why, you know, I try to do as much as I can to be prepared. But there's been a million small moments like this is going back years. And I doubt Greg Popovich even remembers this. But we're in a pregame meeting with Pop. And it's, you know, producer, myself, play by play and reporter. And I happen to be the analyst that night. And he said something really quick, like, uh, you, you know, Doris, you're a basketball person. You get this. And I thought, I mean, I tried to like, <laughs> I was like, I I tried like all change. I tried to be cool and be cool. <laughs> but, you know, little small moments like that where it's really, you know, it's helped me believe that I belong. I remember another person like Rick Carlisle, right? Everybody thinks of him as this you know, persnickety. He doesn't want to give anything away. Ooh, that's a good word. But he, he died. <laughs> same, situa oh. same situation. And we finished the coaches meeting and he's about to walk out. And instead he turned around, he grabbed me by my shoulders. He sort of turned me to him and he just said, you know, something like you're doing a good job or something like that. So I don't know if there's ever been a moment that I've ever felt super comfortable on the air. <laughs> there have been moments where I'm like, okay, I, I think you can relax and have a little bit of fun here. I will say well, this. Well, a lot of people, and I'll, I'll let you go. So I do a lot yeah. of social media stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously, I think Mike Breen is, you know, people love him and he doesn't get roasted. But most of the part, everyone else kind of gets the back and forth. Like, you know, 
everybody, you know, obviously from like Mark Jackson to Chris Webber to Shaq and Charles, nobody gets more love on social media than oh, you the do. Most loved. People are like, thank God Doris Burke is on this game. I can finally listen to it. Like, you, you know, know Chen, Jenny, you know, I'm right here, right? You know, I'm standing <laughs> right here, right in front of you, Channing. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, you know, normally you I, go I to Twitter I, and you I, see I Richard's name trending and you're like, oh, what did he do now? When you see Be DB right. trending, you're like, oh, yeah. Like, she's okay, up. she's killing it. But yeah. You're like, Richard, what did you say? Oh, God. <laughs> I said, I, I, I called, I said something bad about Phil Jackson. I'm, I'm the new Scotty Pippen. No, I'm just oh, I didn't no, say no, I didn't say I, I didn't say No, but, Dor but, but Doris, where I have to give you the ultimate compliment is – when you retire and Channing and Allie, they both know this. When you stop playing basketball and then you watch basketball, you watch it from a completely different perspective. That's one thing that I will say. And maybe that was something that I missed out when I was playing. If I would have watched it with the same eye, the same strategic eye, the same, the same coaching mood, but also listening to how you and Mark and, and Hubie and, you know, how you guys break down the game and the way you, do your prep that allows you to discuss certain things at certain moments. I've learned so much in such a short time. That's my favorite thing to do. And so I understand the love that the fans have for you because when I watch these games now and I listen to you call the games, but I'm like breaking you down, like I break down, uh, like if I was about to guard somebody on the court and I'm like, okay, he likes to do this. This, what, this is what he does well, this is what he doesn't well. But now I do it from a broadcasting standpoint and like you are so good and so prepared that like you have helped me become a better broadcaster because I see what you're doing i see the way you the way you prep and your approach to the game and how you can be critical but not harsh you can be stern but fair and there's so many things that you do naturally and you do well that like i just like now whenever you're doing a game i'm like sitting here and i'm sitting down here trying to learn something maybe not necessarily about the game but just about your approach and it is just people it is, it is next level as an individual that's trying to do the job that you are doing. It is, it is so much fun to listen to you call games. Well, I appreciate that. But I'm going to say you guys missed the first 10 years where Twitter became a thing. <laughs> because, because I had people saying stuff like, Doris Burke has her hair pulled back so tight you could bounce a quarter off her head. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they might say, can we please get... Aaron Andrews on the sideline, so I don't have to look at this mid forties now. <laughs> woman. <laughs> okay, hang that's on. Why, but that's, but that's, that's why they get Twitter. That's why they, yeah, that's why they get Twitter. I didn't but get they're Twitter not talking about Twitter. you and what you're doing. <laughs> they're just making fun of you, which feels better in a way. Like you could be like, Channing, what is up with your outfit? I'm like, hey, you didn't talk about the show though. So yeah. <laughs> my outfit's trash, but at least you like the show. At yeah. least you're watching. Yeah. Doris, yeah. why, okay, like in that moment though, because yeah. I will say I've had to look to people like yourself. I mean, I've had moments where I've asked you in the midst of like actually us doing our jobs, whether in the back of a huddle it or works. we've been next to each other. I remember, I, I remember in 2018, that Boston series and, and I was losing my mind over, really Richard? You have cavities, no, it was, Richard. It's no, 2021, you can't have mercury have cavities. Cavity. No, I touched my camera because I thought I touched I know, the screen. But did I you eat chocolate? And then I made it worse. <laughs> Will you shut up and let, let her finish, Sorry, dude? And I just... I'm sitting there next to you and, and you always give time. Like that's the one thing that so many people, the casual fan, the viewer that tunes in, um, they get to see you do your job. But behind the scenes, the one thing that I've always appreciated about you is that you always give yourself. You give yourself, you give yourself to so many people like me who are aspiring to be like you. And um, I think that goes so far above and beyond. But I think there's times where I was just talking to Richard the other day, and I've even probably used this example with you, Channing, as you guys came into the space and you kind of turned to me to vent. Um, I use an example um, of when, Doris, you've always told me that we will say things, we will stutter, we will fumble, people will say things about us. And guess what? It's going to continue to happen because we're human, one, um, and, and like not everyone's going to like us. Not everyone's going to be a fan of us, but like right. mentally, how do you continue to still stay who you are, stay great at what you do with all of that surrounding you? 
Because I think yeah. there's so much to that that makes people great, that separates you from so many people. Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, when these guys just referenced it, right, Channing and RJ just referenced this sort of like, there isn't one of us who isn't subject to um, like or dislike. It certainly feels a lot nicer to be liked. And, but the nature to me of broadcasters is your, your career arc is going to go up and at some point it's coming back down the other side. You know, all of us, all of us probably have- That was my children. <laughs> oh, hello to <my> children. <laughs> they missed that, yeah. sorry. Aww. Yeah, so the one thing I would say is, and I, I've said this often, Allie, if, if social media became a thing prior to me having have already established myself in the business, I, and I consider myself pretty strong, like mm -hmm. I can take a lot of stuff, but I'm not sure if I wasn't as deep into my career as I was that I would have been able to take some of the things that were said to me in the early part of that. So number one, I've owned, you know, it's not pleasant, it's not fun, all those things. Um, but the one thing I've always said is it's all bullshit anyway. Those are facts. You know, Twitter isn't reality. I don't know what the percentage of the American population that's on Twitter. We're involved in it because we use it as a news source. These athletes use it. It's important in the space we're in. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't mean a damn thing. I always say to young broadcasters, like, you can spend an awful lot of energy worrying about jobs you don't have or why that person was selected and you weren't. You, it's ridiculous. You're, it's wasted space. It's wasted energy. Number one, I hope the players and coaches respect me. If, if I've said something they disagree with, and this is one thing I've always loved about that, men, the men that I've covered, they will just come to me and say, you were wrong about this. And I'd say, okay, this was where I was coming from. And then as soon as that happens, it's over. And that's the way it should be. And, and then number two, like your bosses are going to tell you how you're doing. They will. Yeah. You'll know by yeah. the assignments you get and the fact of the matter is like look at somebody like a Dave Pash or a Mark Jones right these men are absolutely exceptional at what they do and yet there's only so much space mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. so I remember Sean McDonough when he got Monday Night Football as a young broadcaster he had gotten the World Series I believe the National Championship I can't remember but he had done a certain All number of them. Yeah. the best of the best but there's, only, there's enough space for everybody, but those top, top positions where you're always scrutinized, you know, Jeff Morgan face a level of scrutiny, the number two, the number three, the number four teams don't have to face. And so, yeah, I just, Allie, I'm thankful it, it came about at a certain point when I was already established. And number two, it's all bullshit anyway. The, Tell the them, Dorothy. I'm feeling that line. The good and the bad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Don't. Don't. Yeah. yeah don't. Because this is the thing. If you look to them for praise, and you're like, "Oh, they love me," then you'll be like, "Oh, they hate me." So don't allow that. Listen, it's always great to be loved, but don't. It, it's just like in basketball. Don't in our sports. Don't get too high on a win. Don't get too low on the loss. The more right. even keel you are, the better you know chance. But like even to your point, like. Mark Jones, Dave Pass, like these guys are great. And I kind of look at it kind of like the Charles Barkley's, the, the guys that didn't win championships because yeah. Michael Jordan was there. Mike Green right. is like this generation's, you know, Marv Albert, right? Like right. everyone's like, you know, and it doesn't mean that Mark Jones might not be one of the top five to, to ever do it. One of the top two, three of his generation. But when you have a guy like, you know, Mike Breen, who does most of the, like the finals games, and he's been the voice of the NBA, like, it doesn't mean that you're not outstanding at your job. And that's one thing that like, I've enjoyed this, this opportunity. And I've been trying to get Channing to call games, he doesn't want to listen to me. I'm like, Channing, calling games is the most I get, I get to you, you have an interest in that Channing. I do, but I don't. So I do NBA Twitter live and we talk the whole second half. And my problem is, as I switch on to basketball mode. And so I pick a team, which I generally like want to go for that game. And I'm absolutely, I'm like breaking down their like substitution patterns, not in a conducive way. So I have to like, it's, it's hard for me to transition from what's up here to actually what translates. So I need like an alley. So I have Taylor Rooks and Alexis Morgan who helped me. 
translate yeah. this basketball because I'm like, dude, their rotations on the weak side defense are trash. You need to get that top foot up, Kevin Herter on these screens. Like, and I'm saying these things and they're like, Channing, so what do you mean by that? And I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah. So basically he's playing defense because he's afraid of the screen. So they're not communicating. And then I'm like, you know, I'm all over the place in my thoughts, but I need, if I had somebody to kind of metronome me out, I probably would get into it. But right now I'm liking where I'm at. Uh, I get to be all over the place and uh, see what's going on and just talk for a whole half and go home. It's nice. That's, that's it's like to also stir some shit up too. Yeah, well that, <laughs> yes. I don't like, well, here's my thing is, is like you're saying every game, I approach every game. It's hard to do that during a regular season because, you know, the regular season games is more like months. Like who's having a good month? Who's having a good two months, a good two weeks. But during the playoffs, like, to be honest, I don't necessarily like the Milwaukee Bucks, but I respect the shit out of them, right? I think they, they are, are they are, they are things. so frustrating. <laughs> they are so, Doris, 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 but, we, we, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 no I was just, because you said, no, no, you talk, no, go ahead. Because I was, you were about to talk about the Bucks and it just triggered me. So let's talk about it. The Bucks are frustrating because like Chris Middleton is not fancy, but what he did in that fourth quarter was <laughs> mind boggling. He <laughs> <laughs> was, it was like, wait, are you just doing your summertime workouts? I was like, he was doing his thing. And then Giannis, like after his video, I kind of get him. I get him now. Like he's like, he has four moves, right? We, we criticize Ben Simmons for not shooting, but then we criticize Giannis for having four of the most vicious moves of basketball. Straight line drive dunk, straight line left spin, right? The two post up fade away in a 44 second free throw. Those are his four moves. <laughs> <laughs> and he averages 30. It's not pretty and no one else can emulate it, but they win doing that. And that's what's like frustrating to me. It's not pretty, but they win. And I like, you got to respect But that. like, but how pretty is Steph shooting from 40 feet? Like, woo. That's kind of nice. Ooh, that's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. nice. It is kind of nice. 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 Like, let's not talk about the Warriors. Their whole team was amazing. Like they're a team of, wait, what? Draymond's your center and he's six, seven. And you have a dude who's six three who can score on everybody. Oh, and you have Clay who doesn't know what the score is, trying to get fifty in a quarter. <laughs> right? Like those are storylines. You have Drew Holiday, who's one of the quietest, most underrated players of all time. Chris Middleton, who shot 50, 40, 90, who nobody talks about. You have Giannis, who's a two-time MVP, but then like is just very plain and simple. He is a grilled cheese sandwich, like an elite grilled cheese sandwich player. Like if you're hungry. You could eat about 50 of them, but you just, you know, you're going to run out of taste. And then it's like a new age <laughs> San Antonio. Really? It's just like, oh, they're winning again. Oh, they're winning again. Yeah, Doris, are you allowed to pick a team right now or no? Like, Am I allowed? Yeah. Who, 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 I, like, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. No, I know uh, I would concur with, with uh, Channing as it relates to watching the Bucks. Mm -hmm. I a question for you two guys just as it relates to to what Chris has, was able to do last night because he had been struggling right this has not been a postseason there have been mm -hmm. critical games where he struggled for you two guys does that his performance in the fourth with so much riding on it does that you know what is that like for a player to overcome the struggles and then does it in your mind are you more impressed by it given that and then also, I'd love your take on this because, you know, we we in the media, it's fodder for conversation. You know, Kendrick Perkins' big thing right now is Chris is Batman, Giannis is Robin. Allie, this must be a distant. <laughs> I, I said, 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 I think it's a, it's, it's, I, like, on the distaff side, I don't get the argument between Batman and Robin. I'm like, are they not both Batman? And no, no, wait, wait, no, 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 no. Doris, let me, let, Doris, 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 let me help. Let me, let me stretch a little bit and help you out. Oh, here we go. Help you out. All here right, we go. Listen, Doris, Take Richard, Doris, let me sip some chosen. Sip some wine. <laughs> Doris, let me break it down for you. Maybe, okay, maybe it was during the bubble. So we'll just say a year ago because this would be equi the equivalent to the pace. Right. I got a lot of heat. Because I said, okay, I'll be the one to say it. Giannis 
masters of Pippin. He needs to find his Jordan. And I didn't, and like Pippin kind of said something, but look, Pip, like, I understood that. You don't want your name to be used in that sense. My point that I was trying to make is that everybody needs somebody that that helps make them a complete player or it helps complete their team. Giannis is so similar to Shaq where he can get you three-fourths of the way. But the last six minutes doesn't mean that he can't be on the court. Like Ben Simmons, they were struggling to keep him on the court. But Giannis can't be the playmaker. He can't be the free throw guy. He can't be the, we're down three, we need a shot. He needs that. Similar to like Shaq needed Kobe. Shaq needed D-Wade. Shaq needed Penny Hardaway. And Shaq was the best player on all those teams. But like, he was not winning championships without Kobe Bryant doing what Kobe Bryant was doing. Now, Kobe Bryant might have been the second best player in the world behind his own teammate. That was part of their rift. Like Shaq would get a ton of credit. The point is this. Giannis can't be the fourth quarter closer. Doesn't mean he can't have big games. Doesn't mean he can't do great things. He needs a guy that can go and give you a 15-point quarter in the fourth because that's his shining moment. It's like, Giannis, I got it the rest of the way. Very similar to Kobe would say, I got it the rest of the way. Very similar to D. Wade would say that. So, You know, he's saying, oh, well, now he's Batman. It's like, yes, I said, and again, it's not a matter who said it, but it's more about, it's been this conversation that people like attack me because they're like, he's the two-time MVP, boo, boo, boo. And I'm like, yo, doesn't mean he can't be the best player on his team in the last five minutes. And that's to me where Chris Middleton has proven, mind you, he did it, uh, like he's done it throughout his career, but like to be a fourth quarter guy, if Giannis had a fourth quarter guy around him, a Kyrie, a Dame Lillard, a guy that like even a Trey Young, a step. If those guys were to be next to 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 Giannis, it would be unstoppable. It would be unstoppable, in my opinion. And I think that's where he's doing the Batman Robin thing. But at the end of the day, it's really just saying that when it gets to the fourth quarter, the last five minutes, if Giannis is the most important player on your team, your team is not going to be able to finish the game consistently oh. the way you should. But I kind of agree with, like, Doris, to your point, are you saying, like, why do we have to go there? Like, why does it always have to be, like, I I don't know. I I, I was trying to understand what's it. uh, So, in essence, you guys are clarifying and saying this isn't necessarily a um, a he's better, like Batman. No, 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 no. But that's how we all take it, right? It is. And I wonder, you know, do the players, would the players get offended? And to me, it's just silly. It's. If they win a championship in today's day and age, you seem to need at least two, right? Mm-hmm. How Jeez. would the series, series B if Kawhi Leonard were on the floor? Think about that. You know, going into to game four, we were two free throws away from the series being flipped the other way, 2-1. The margin, and I don't have to tell these guys, they're both NBA champions. Um, the margin between lin- winning and losing in this league is this small. Yeah. And the other part is it does require, there does require to be some luck involved. Like this shit is hard. Hard. It's hard. And the NBA is hard. And like, I just, I'm intrigued by this whole Batman. I thought it was something I, maybe I'm a woman I couldn't understand, but it's, I'm glad you added context because it's not about who's better or who's the best right. player. It's more about game structure. To Channing's point, he's got four moves, all of which end in the paint which you can shrink the floor, crowd it, make it more difficult. And so now he's, he needs somebody else who's a shot creator. So in, in today's yeah. age, the best example is Jokic and Jamal Murray. Yeah. So Jokic can control yeah. the whole game, right. but he, he has trouble winning because Jamal Murray's best skill set is to go get a bucket in crunch time, right? You look at uh, LeBron James. Now LeBron, as clutch as he is, Right. Who did he go to when everybody was locked down and we had the best opportunity to win the game was, oh, Kyrie, you have the best matchup. Let me go to you. So like even James Harden and Kevin Durant, like James Harden will take over the first, you know, 40 minutes. Kate Kyrie, KD, go get the ball because we you can get us a bucket. I think it has to do with your skill set. And Giannis's skill set is to control the game the first three, three and a half quarters. And in that fourth quarter, you got to give it to somebody where if they get fouled, that's a 90% free throw shooter. Yes. Can they the rims yes. To the mid-range? And they can do that repeatedly on two or three players. 
So for me, it's about skill set. And, you know, you could say Batman and Robin. I'm into comic books. I like Batman and Superman. Like oh, Superman we is great. We're not, we're not. Listen, I love Chris Middleton. He had a great game. We're not giving him Superman Chris quite Middleton, yet. Let's, we're not going, I'm going to say this Janet, right now. This Janet, is not no, spicy. But your, but your free throw no, no. point is great. Go ahead. He, that was one of the best performances we've seen in the last couple of years in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Well, I don't I in, 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 a, I, I, in a need in a in a need moment when they were down all, all game down the last five, like five minutes ago they're down five six points and all of a sudden once it went to plus five it was a wrap but to your point Channing Doris when you when you look at Giannis so many great players you give them the ball and say go get me a bucket a free throw or something. Where with Giannis in the last few years where Bud has gotten so much criticism, Giannis has gotten so much criticism, you can play one way during the regular season, but the postseason, you're going to have to, you lose your game in the regular season because you miss free throws. Like, all right, we got, it's game 15, with game 63, we got a ton more. You get to that postseason and you miss a game, you miss games because of free throws or lack of offense. The whole world is watching you in that moment. And Giannis was just not a guy that you can toss the ball and say, all right, he got fouled. Well, he's going to give me three out of four free throws, or he's going to give me five out of six free throws in the fourth quarter. That ain't it. So you can't go to him, not consistently. Yeah. And that's where I think Giannis having turns Chris into Middle, the Chris, five. Yeah, Middleton becomes, turns into the five that's, what, that's what, yeah, that's what made Middleton's performance that much greater is because he if they if he doesn't do that the bucks don't have another way to will themselves to win Giannis right. can only do so much right. I, I look at like how much that Bogdanovich hurts the Hawks right they're looking at that number two and so I mean to be honest when they signed him I was like oh this dude's like that and then all of a sudden he was hurt and then this, the, the reason the Hawks are really great is because Trey Young gets tired. He can give you three quarters, two and a half. If you notice, they were up five. Gallinari at 18, I think, last night. So when he came back after his ankle tweak, they were down three, right? Uh, Milwaukee made it to five. They had the wide open bunny on the right side, the three-pointer. He missed. Bow. They come back. I think they take that timeout. And I said on my show, I said, that's such a huge shot. Because if Milwaukee scores again, being down seven with three minutes to go, where Bogdanovich has missed the last two, and Trey Young is kind of iffy on his thing. Collins gave you the face-up jumper. Uh, uh, Clint Capella was okay. But then no one else was, like, really hidden. So who is second for Atlanta? That's the reason they've been losing is because the first game, it was uh, John Collins and Clint Capella had out of their mind games and they were rebounding. The second game... They exposed Bogdanovich in the third game. They just couldn't make open shots. So they, the Hawks need a two guy. And Chris Middleton said, Kevin Herter, come get on this hibachi. <laughs> and everybody else, extra zucchini for you, right? I, I'm interrupting you because number one, just to Richard's point, you need to be doing games oh. for, two, for two reasons. Number one, it's the most fun job. It blows away studio. Uh, you know, Allie could probably speak to both because she's been in both roles. <laughs> you need to do it. Like, I'm listening to what you're saying. The play-by-play -play will guide you, and you need repetition, but you would be absolutely freaking brilliant. Oh, yeah. So you should be doing it. The NBA playoffs are here, and you'll be in hoops heaven betting all the action on FanDuel Sportsbook. There are so many exciting matchups, and FanDuel is taking that excitement to a whole nother level. Because new and existing users, all customers can bet risk-free throughout the playoffs. Once you have a FanDuel Sportsbook account, you can bet one same-game parlay risk-free every week. That means you can combine multiple bets for an even bigger win. And if you don't win, you'll get up to $10 back. And this week, I'm going to flip the script with my bet. And how about leaning into a full CP3 redemption tour, if you will? Sun's currently up 3-1 in the Western Conference Finals. How about a Chris Paul Finals MVP at plus 410. Hard to argue with it the way the Suns are playing, large in part because of CP3 himself. Basketball fans, now is the perfect time to give FanDuel a shot. New Year'sers can still get up to $1,000 back if your first bet doesn't win. Just sign up with the promo code ROADTRIPPIN to bet the NBA playoffs risk-free. That's code ROADTRIPPIN, exclusively on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Disclaimer, 21 and older and present in New Jersey risk-free bet for the first online real money wager only and refund issued 
as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Same game parlay refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund, $10. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay available for multiple sports in all states on mobile backslash web. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. This episode of Road Trippin' is brought to you by Bourbon Time. Even if you don't have a traditional nine to five schedule, there is no denying that this past year has changed the way that work and rest intersect. Without a designated office to come home from, we're missing that natural break in our days. Our friends at Jim Beam recognize this phenomenon and they wanna help us out. Beat the burnout and start blocking off the hour of 6 to 7 p.m. as your me time, where you can do what you love for you and only you. And what better way to spend my me time than with my feet up enjoying a nice smooth glass of Jim Beam. So let's make the idea of bourbon time a reality. Join me in reclaiming 6 to 7 p.m. as the happiest hour so you can do whatever it is that makes you happy. And if that involves a glass of bourbon, remember to drink Jim Beam responsibly. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, copyright 2021, James B. Beam Distilling Company, Claremont Kentucky. I hate to take over your podcast, Allie, but I take it I over. Have, take it I over, Dorothy. So I, I wouldn't mind asking them another question as it relates to another player here that was just mentioned because this stuff fascinates me. And again, it goes back to these guys are the best in the world. If you've made it to the whatever number of spots available in the league, you, you are doing something freaking right. You know, you, you mentioned Ben Simmons, and I have to be honest with you. I sat there and watched that final game for the Sixers, and my reaction was, I hurt for that kid. Like, he was so shattered from a confidence perspective that I was like, oh, man, this is freaking hard to watch. It's hard to watch. It's comfortable. And I can't, listen, it's on him to a certain extent, right? You have to put in the work, and you have to be willing to put yourself out there on the limb. From your perspective, guys, like, To, is because it looks to me like for both Giannis and, and Ben, this is a mental battle as it relates to free throws, as it relates to perimeter game. It's more mental battle. Mm -hmm. And both, and like, I'm not, I remember as a player for myself, and please, I'm not drawing a direct parallel. I realized I played college basketball. No, 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 you understand, you understand the player's but, mentality. But here's my, thing. My, my whole career, like, whatever it was drive and one off the bounce I had a handle that could get me anywhere and that's how I lived and it was such a stupid moment that that triggered my fear and jump shooting I'm a freshman in high school the team I, I step in a varsity game at Christmas and I miss jumper after jumper and it was at that point where I realized well you can't stay in front of me anyway so I don't have to take that shot I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to the yeah. cup and I'm going to score you know whatever you know and is this a mental battle? Is it a place they can get past? And, or is it mechanically both of them are so, you know, Giannis still takes time, even if he makes that three, the, the release point, the process to get it to his pocket, it takes time. Like, can they fundamentally get there? How much is physical? How much is mental? Can I start? Please. I just want, okay, so Giannis and Ben are completely opposite. I, after listening to Giannis and talking to PJ, whoever, Giannis puts in so much work, he feels like he deserves that shot. Yes. So even mm -hmm. if he missed his five or six, he's yep. like, I, I, you, nobody yells at him for those shots. And he knows for his progression, he needs well, to take those. Because at the end of the day, he's going to give you 30, but he's going to take four shots where you go, why would you do that? That's because he feels like he deserves it. So yeah. if he makes, like last night, he made the three. Did you notice he started, he made his little fadeaway in crunch time. He shot that bullshit fadeaway that he missed in game one, but he <laughs> made it. And then what did he do the next time? Went to the same little right shoulder fadeaway, made that. <laughs> he feels like he deserves it. He feels like even if he is free throws, okay, we said this, they got to stop counting because you're making my man switch them things. I was about to say, especially in Brooklyn, if you get hit with that count over and over, and Giannis did the same thing every time. He doesn't. Well, 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 the, the problem is that they, they, they don't call it. If the, if the NBA called it and that crowd was alerting the NBA in a way that allowed them to get the violation, then it would work. 
because now he's nervous about the numbers being called. But yes. because the NBA won't make that violation call, right, when it's well past 10 seconds, even once a game, like you get a three seconds call, you can get that. The fact that they won't make the call, that's what's making the 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 the, the chance unsuccessful. Yeah. If okay. they got to 12 and the NBA was like, and, and like the referee was like, boom, that's 10 seconds, even though the crowd was at 12, now he starts to think about it. Yeah. Now he's like, oh, they're at nine, they're at 10. Okay, I need to shoot it. And But there's but because they're not calling it, it eliminates the effectiveness of what the crowd is doing. Okay, totally. getting back to Ben now. So Sorry. Ben, I don't know, like, and I'm just going to go to my own thing. When I was one for 20 in the Western Conference Finals, right? Steve Kerr sat me down and told me, you need to chill out, right? But it was because Phil Jackson's rotations were crazy. So in the Spurs series, it was always Ginobili rotating to me, and he was too small. In this series, it was Ron Artest, Kobe, Derek Fisher, and Lamar Odom. So that's a little different. That's a lot of different people, and it was always the tallest player next to me. Anyways, and I'm not questioning Ben Simmons and what he does in the summer or what he does every single day. But if you work out hard enough, you have some sense of, I deserve this. Even if I miss 10, I've seen myself make 5,000 of these, yeah. right? So for me, I got into that weird funk where I was like, I don't want to shoot anymore. And Steve Kerr goes, Channing, think about how many hours you spent playing this game in your life shooting the basketball. I'm not asking you to post up. I'm not asking you to do anything. I just need you to shoot it with confidence. Imagine you're in the gym in Portland or in Arizona as a kid and you're just shooting it. We watched somebody show that clip of him this summer at the high school joint, shooting right. it, form all shitty, right? He was in there with confidence playing. Where is that? <clears throat> That's from not following through with that work every single day. His form ain't that bad. If Tristan Thompson can switch hands in the NBA, anybody can fix their jumper. Right. If Kevin Martin can shoot and, lead and average 25 points for a career, yeah. if Sean Marion can be almost a Hall of Famer, which I sort of think he might, he, if he could shoot like that, man, Sean Marion, his little jumper, you'd be like, what the hell is that? Bow, let him make one. It's over. So That's you're saying it's mental with Ben? It's mental because I don't know if he's putting in the amount of hours to get over that mental block. It's You got to put 10,000 hours into something you're not even... He's not at a, oh, no, thank you. He's not even at a college level of shooting. You yeah. don't have a spot. Give me a spot. He's 6'10". He's a guard. He can go anywhere on the court. He's yeah. special. Are you telling me you can't shoot a free throw line jumper? Oh, oh, okay, so I, this this is going to be funny, and I'm going to give some context to this, and that's a good point, Jan. But, Jan, you were a shooter, so they were telling you to keep shooting because you weren't going to be in the league if you stopped shooting in that Phoenix series. I'll touch you. But Doris, hey, I Doris, did a one dribble pull up. Fuck you. Doris, <laughs> when I came into this league, I didn't have a broken shot, but I wasn't a shooter. I did. Shut up, dick. And, <laughs> Bro. But hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. I pulled up the stats Come because when I, tell, when I tell people this, I want to make sure they understand the context. So I shot, I came off the bench my rookie year. I shot 56 threes. I shot 56 threes. We didn't shoot a lot of threes back in the day. I made 13 of them. Do you know how many I shot in my second year? I shot 24 threes. I shot less threes as a starter because I was like, screw it. To your point, Doris, I was missing them. I was like, I'm just going to drive. None of you guys can stay in front of me anyway. Like there's nothing, there's nothing there that's going to stop this crew from, okay. from like stopping me from dunking or whatever. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep driving. Then Larry drew, but I was putting in work every single day, every single day, every single day. I was shooting hundreds of shots, hundreds of shots. I just wasn't shooting them in the game. So my third year, Larry drew, we were, he was my, my assistant coach and we were working every single day. And he was like, Richard, you got to start shooting. You got to start shooting some of these things in the game. And I was like, nah, whatever. I was like, dude, I'm averaging, you know, 15, 17 a game. I don't need threes. Whatever. They're overrated. He's like, Richard, you're shooting these every day. You've earned the right to shoot them. Whether He's like, do this, Richard. Shoot one a game. Promise right. me, if we're going to come here every day, you shoot one a game. If you make it, shoot another one. But every game, you got to shoot at least one. And then that way, if you miss 10 in a row, it's one a game. Who gives a damn? You're not, you don't feel that pressure. So nice. I was like, I was like, all right, cool. I'll do it. Then that next year I went for, I went from 23% my first year, 25% my next year. Yeah, Channing, I went to the NBA finals both years. Shut up. 
the next year, but the next year, but the next, but but the next year, I shot thirty six percent from three when Larry Drew finally convinced me to shoot one a game, one a game, and it was like that's where I respect Giannis because if you're putting in the work, you've earned those. You put in that work. You don't care if you miss. It sucks to miss, but like that's what always what Kobe Bryant used to say. Why am I going to pass it to those guys? Those guys aren't working as hard as me. Right? right, even if Giannis is shooting the, and it's not to compare the two, but like the, the example that I try and relate to back to me is that I made a decision after my first year that I was going to shoot less threes. I went from coming off the bench to starting for a full year and shot less threes, but I was putting in the work every day. And finally, when the work met the opportunity and I had the right coach, I was like, look, dude, until you shoot one a game, there's no point in us working on this for an hour every single day, pre-practice and post-practice. So finally, I was like, all right, I'll shoot one a game. And then those things started going in. And then they had to come a little bit close. Because he was like, Richard, they're not going to guard you. So you're really going to get an uncontested wide open three. And they started going in. And then the paint just started opening up. It just started opening up. Because now it's like, you hit two of these. You hit three of these. Okay, they get a little closer. They couldn't stay in front of you when they were giving you space. Now that they're a little bit closer, the game is different. So to Channing's point, Giannis has the right mentality. I don't give a shit. I'm going to airball <laughs> some. I'm going to miss some. Oh, hey. fucking no. How much, well, let me know. How much? On the streets of Mykonos. And how now much? he's a two-time MVP. Come how on. Much? You think he give a shit? Uh, and to that point, how much does that factor into Giannis? That's what's different with Ben. Ben doesn't Giannis, have but, that on his back. He's but, not a two-time but, 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 MVP. No, but 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 Ben has a lot of it. Become very, very, it's very, very mental. It's very, very mental. Yeah. I, we, we talked about Giannis talking about and laughing. Like, he doesn't want to, but he's like, yo, this is a part of what it is. The failure is a part of success. There is no courage without fear. And right now, the lack of, like, courage that he is showing yeah. is, that's what's disheartening. It's like, you're not, it's not from, like, you can't play or you're not good or you don't have the skills. It's like, your lack of courage to even just go out there and to attempt certain things and your game is making it so that you don't even want to, like, you drive, they're like, oh, he's such a good driving kick. It's like, yeah, because he doesn't want to drive and finish because he doesn't want to shoot free throws. Well, like, to, to your point, guys, you know, we, we had a Zoom with Steph Curry earlier this year. And one of the things Steve Kerr said to us in our Zoom with him was he's, he's moved beyond fear. And so I said to Steph when we had him in the Zoom next, I said, well, how, how do you move beyond fear? He said, because I failed at the highest level. I have failed in the biggest moments. And I said, fear, fear is not failure. Uh, failure is not fatal. And he said, that's exactly right. Failure is not fatal. All of that's us fail. Beautiful. We've all yeah. failed. And, and all of us will continue to fail in, in, in a variety of different ways. So I just, I, I'm hopeful for Ben. I think he's such a, a monster talent. And, and when you're seeing that play out in such a public way, um, I mean, I don't know how you feel, Ali, but I, I'm telling you, as I watch this kid fail publicly, I'm dying for him. You know, and it's just a matter of how do you get to that mental space that you're like, fuck this, I'm taking the shot. And it goes to what these two gentlemen said. Well, it's I like, think, it's, if you put in the work. To your, and to your point, I think like for everyone who understands not just basketball, but competition in that moment, that one sole possession, that one sole play, I thought Jim Jackson called it perfectly. It's, that's when you know the game is in your head. Yeah. But as we all know, there's only one person that can get themselves out of their head. And that's Ben Simmons. And it's up to him. And, yeah. you know, so I, I thought you said, that's, the, that's, the, that's the sports psychologist The like, you yeah. got to talk to them all, man, because we know Doc Rivers is one of the most beloved coaches by his players. Like you could say whatever you want about his playoff record, but you've never heard Doc Rivers took confidence from a player. You never heard Brett Brown, who I had in San Antonio, one of the nicest guys in the world. Like yeah. he was there forever. So you have two coaches. This is no disrespect. This is not Scott Skiles. It's not Greg Popovich. This oh, is not I like Scott. No, I, lo I like Scott, but I'm saying he's a very tough coach. He's oh, a very shit. tough coach yeah. and not everybody can play for him. Like I, I, I think Scott <laughs> yeah, is you a great have coach. Some steel nuts. So yeah, you gotta have some steel nuts. I like Scott. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying though. If you look at his two coaches that he has had, oh, yeah. It, it's like, okay, well, we can't look at, well, the coach took his confidence, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe that doesn't mean that every move that they make is right, but they're such genuinely like basketball, like nice, like pat on the back guys. Like they're like the, the uncle, the grandfather, that's who those guys are. And so it's like, if it's not that, 
if it's not talent, if it's not skill, there was questions about his work ethic, but even his work ethic, his mental is affecting him more than his work ethic, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, you could you work harder and improve your mental? Yes, but that's not the final stage. I think there has to be something that gets to him. But all that being said, there's a lot of teams that would appreciate every single thing that Ben Simmons brings to them. No doubt. Like the yeah, but the Philly Phillies 76ers are like, well, we're trying to win a championship, and these issues aren't going to help us get there because I really, space. I think Joel Embiid's window is by about five years. In my five opinion, years as a, mar, as a marquee guy, yeah, uh, he's still in his twenties. I understand, but the way I'm, he plays, this was one of his better years, and he still missed. I think 20 games. So like for me, it's I'm just I'm not like, saying he's going to get to Tim Duncan, 37 years old. I, that's okay, why I said okay. five more years, five yeah. more years. Respectfully, Ben, I, I wish more for him. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. We don't have- Simmons in Portland would be great. I like that. Play Every the time a player has an opportunity to go somewhere else, Channing, it's always Portland. I want to see Damian Lillard be in the brightest stage. I want to see him at the Western Conference in the finals. He's exciting to me. I, I, co- I co-sign that. I co-sign that 100. Damian deserves it. You talk about a guy who works and you, yeah. you, you talk about a guy whose legacy, like it, the casual NBA fan should know that this is one of the greatest range shooters in the history of the game. And because of the numbers obscene, absurd, describe it as you will with Steph Curry, I almost, I don't know if he's getting lost. He's certainly not getting lost in this group and with people who tune into the NBA, but this is one of the great range shooters and one of the great clutch performers and do enough people know that, how good his career has been until he gets to that, that stage you're talking well, about. Dor- Doris, the, be- the best way that I've found to describe it is Doris, or Doris Burke, Dame <laughs> Lillard, Dame Lillard is your favorite basketball player, favorite basketball player. So, like, who, who, whoever your favorite basketball player yeah. is, if yeah. you were to ask him who he loves to watch, Dame Lillard is always at the top of that list. So, just when, you, when you're when you like, oh, my favorite player is D-Wade, my favorite player is Braun, my favorite player is Kobe. Well, you want to know what? All of those guys love to watch Dame Lillard play. Like, yeah. just, just absorb that where it's like, you don't have to like, you you know, you might not like Portland or you might like like this, but like, there's, but just shut up, idiot. There's certain <laughs> people, there's certain people that just like, how do you not love his game? Like yeah. a guy that literally just shoots from wherever, does whatever, doesn't talk trash. He's cold blooded. Like game time is a thing because he does it over and over and over again. The walk off wave is one of the most iconic things in in, in sports history. Screw NBA. Yeah. You show me another person. There's like yeah. Kurt Gibson doing the this, and there's like what you is know, he guys like or he's, he's doing like the fist pump after he hits the That's home run, cool. like the walk off home run. But I'm saying like if you were to go in like some of the most <laughs> iconic sports moments, Chang doesn't understand baseball references. But like I've been watching a lot more baseball lately because uh, like Fernando he, Tatis like, Jr. He's a bad yes. boy. He's a bad he's boy. So bad. We yeah, don't want to take boy. too much more of your time because obviously we I know love you, Doris. Doris, but Thank I do you. just have a couple questions if we can ask you, um, yes. like when it to you, when it comes to you, your career, whether it's personal, professional, whatever it is, one of your favorite memories so far throughout your career that you've had. Uh, I probably interviewed LeBron after the championship in Cleveland, just because um, a lot of people don't know this, but um, people who knew me and like could hear my voice, you know, you're not supposed to get emotional. And I hope Golden State knows I was not rooting for the Cleveland Cavaliers. No offense, guys. You know, the best That's case, okay. scenario, best case okay. scenario for TV is that kind of series where game seven is coming down the wire. Um, but to watch an athlete just pour into it what he did and then to have him break down. Like I got choked up. I'm not supposed to get choked up, but he's bawling. His shoulders are shaking. And I'm like, Dave Green, Mike Green's longtime stat man, great historian of the NBA. Like Dave is tremendous. He said to me on the way to the, back to the, uh, to the airport that night, because did did you get choked up? I'm like, shit, did you pick up? (laughs) And he's like, well, you know, your voice wavered a little bit. I'm like, Pull yourself together here. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
doors because of that moment. Thank God you didn't see Richard crying like a little baby. Yeah, well, yeah. First of all, you started crying at Taco Tuesday two days later after yeah. the parade. You were like, it hit me. It's real. It's just real right now. That's my safe place. No, but, but Doris, Doris, to your point, and, and like, I stay out of the go conversation because I, I there it, my opinion doesn't matter because I'm, I'm connected to Braun. But I'm just yeah. like, have you ever seen in our lifetime ever in history an athlete from a hometown saying, I'm going to win this place and championship? Yeah. What kind of shit is, and then do it. Like, yeah. and it's like, he didn't like he had to go the hardest route and like he's from that town and they have the most disgusting sports history ever it's not like a kid grows up in LA and is like I'm gonna turn the Lakers into a champion they're like yeah you're gonna have a lot of help right and it's like for a guy to do that that's something that's never been done in history for a guy to grow up in a state grow up in a town get drafted by the town and say I'll be back we're going to win a championship I have to finish what I started and like that to us, like we all wanted to win our championship for our own selves, but we also knew what journey that dude was on that's different from the journey that all of us are on. And that is not to we're, we're teammates and we're boys, but we're like, dude, I can sit here and be like, yo, the, the journey that that dude is on is different than the journey that I was on. And so right. if you respect that journey, then you see the emotion and you're like, dude, I don't know how you did that shit, man. Good, right. for, good for you. So, so for you to get emotional rare, in that moment, it's the rare, right, it's the rare person, RJ, um, to me. And first of all, those guys, the LeBrons, the KDs, who can do what they do in the moments they do them, that's those are a handful of people. Those are the rarest of the rare. All of us in life, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm always trying to relieve pressure off myself. I'm not trying yes. to. Yes. I'm not saying it. <laughs> yes. That's my, fa- that's my favorite thing is how can I eliminate all stress? And LeBron is taken, taken on all the pressure. And remember, you know, it's, it's the long view of, it's not just that moment. You're right. It's the long view. It's what happened when he went, left Cleveland and the ugliness, the ugliness that was shown to this man across this country it, you know, they're just a million things. The other favorite moment, Allie, like I remember being courtside in Miami when San Antonio has them on the ropes and it's so far down the path that the red velvet thing yeah. is lining the court. And, and I've got Todd Harris, God bless him. God rest his soul. He passed away far too young. He was always the man who escorted me to the court to get to the, the, you know, the platform or whatever they build when a team wins it. And I am rifling through my head questions for Greg Popovich, for Tim, for, you know, Tony. And then Ray Allen hits a shot. And I'm just, he and I look at him like, <laughs> oh, effing kidding me. He just I have made- like the chills right now. It gives me anxiety to think about what you had to go through in those moments to change. Yeah, so it's a, I have been blessed. I mean, think I, I have seen so many incredible things. I played and coached in the Big East, and I watched Gino Ariema build a Connecticut program that hadn't won anything in any amount of time before he arrived to, to now absurd things. One of my favorite moments, Allie, um, and it's, funny, it's one of the most unprofessional moments of my career, in addition to getting choked up when LeBron wins the title, I've had many <laughs> professional moments. But um, 1997, uh, the, the first WNBA game, and um, I'm at the Forum, and I grew up a Laker fan, believe it or not, East Coast kid, but I love the way the Lakers played. And uh, in, it's 1997, I'm in the Forum, I've got all these uh, memories of all the moments, the, the beauty shots of LA coming over the Forum, down, you know, you name it. And it's the first professional game in women's basketball history in the United States of America. Actually, I shouldn't say that because the ABL did play, but not with the pomp and circumstance. I'm calling the game for radio. I didn't get the TV job. I got the radio job my first year in New York. And, uh, and I'm working with the great Gus Johnson. And Val Ackerman's at the center court at, at the forum. And I'm trying to do a radio broadcast and I'm bawling. I'm absolutely <laughs> That's awesome. Bawling eyes out awesome. i've got goosebumps i cannot believe professional basketball for women will be played in the united states under the umbrella essentially of the nba 
I mean, really, I have been so damn lucky. Think about it. The timing for me was perfect. Women's basketball coverage was exploding by the grace of God. And I say it all the time, by the grace of God, you know, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Mm. The legend. Seriously. Doris Park. I have that shirt too. I was mad. I should have bought it. <laughs> I should have bought it. The I, I wish my, my, my children, my children refuse to wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I wear it all yeah. the time. See, um, Doris, Doris said you're just, you're just, you know, if your kids were just a smidge younger, my kids don't have a choice what they wear. I just pour stuff on them. Oh, you guys like Arizona? I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you this. Like the other night in in Game Three, uh, I think it was after Game Three. Uh, Patrick Beverly called me a gangster twice in the post game. <laughs> I said, Patrick, I think that's the first time that descriptor's been used for me. So I called both my children. I said, from now on, if you could just refer to me as G it's instead gang- of G. Me. <laughs> I will say really quick because we did get a lot of questions. A lot of people want to know if you really have a friendship with Drake. No, not really. I mean, <laughs> you said that so fast. He's quite kind. I mean, uh, you know, I've I've literally seen him in person like three times and we've exchanged a nice conversation. I will say this to you, Allie, like, and I said this to him the very first time, there's video footage of this. And I said to him when I finally met him after him wearing that shirt, and I said, you know, I I don't think this was your intention, but I, I do very much appreciate you expressing respect for my work because I do think it helped change some people's feelings about me as a broadcaster. And it's one of those little moments, Channing, where somebody's done something that's made a difference. And I can't remember exactly what he said. He goes like, I don't think you understand. Like, you know, I, I, you're great or whatever he said, I don't remember, but I just remember. That that, cool. Yeah, but uh, yeah. And, and when it happened, I really had no clue how big a deal it was because my daughter just looked at me, she was, ooh. She goes, you are really not understanding exactly. You're how not they- understanding. <laughs> no, yeah. you're like, not understanding. No, no. It, it's so, like, and, and, and it's hard for us because we don't want to disrespect our legends. Like, but that's Michael Jackson saying it. That's Prince saying it. That's Elvis Presley saying it. Like, he is that iconic at this point in time. Like, seven number one albums, 50 yeah. number one hits. Like, I know he's Drake and he's a, you know, pop rap star and he's like, you know, that guy in Toronto. But literally, he, he he's one of the icons. He's no one of question. the icons. And he is in that same category of Elvis and Prince and, and Michael sure. Jackson. Like, so like to have one of those guys just come, and that's a huge basketball fan, outwardly come out and be like, Doris Burke, she's that boss. Like, that. yes, yes. And he didn't why- understand in that moment. I was so thankful, Channing, to get the chance to say thank you to him in person. And it happened maybe a year later, you know, just at a, a you know regular season Raptors game. Go ahead. You got more? I don't want to, like, uh, what else you got? Is that it? You got more? Oh, we got a lot of questions. <laughs> She's like, we got a lot of questions. There's a, a lot of people just wanted to, like, literally express their love for you. Um, oh, I do like who, this who, one. Because we've who had asked that moment. question? Who, who asked the question, though, Allie? Did we get, oh, we don't, yeah. Do we not see it up there? Do we want to give them credit? Yeah, it's Radiator Poppy. It's just so hard with the names because I don't really know their handles. Um, But there's that one. Uh, Angelica J85 said, who have you been most nervous about interviewing? Channing Fry. (laughs) No, only President Obama. Oh, no big deal. Only, only. Oh, no big deal. <laughs> the only one where I thought, oh my God, I am so afraid. It was when I was covering women's college basketball. We went to do the brackets with him and I'm trying to be so cool. And I said something so snarky. Like he asked me, did I play anymore? Or how was I or something? And smart ass <laughs> said, I think I could check your left hand, Mr. President. <laughs> oh God. God, yes. And, and then and then Doris Burke became his favorite broadcaster. Too. <laughs> Someone just for or one for all of you, just because it all um, comes together, said name a bigger or better sports moment than the 2016 Cavs championship. Do you have one, Doris? Oh boy, uh, the Cubs, the Cubs winning. Yeah. I would that that's and I'm I'm mad that they did. Wow, right that hurts we did it. Yeah, no, it's it's well, there was some there was some poetry to it 
you know, the, the one curse uh, of a town and a team that another team that ended it. I think the Cubs, the Red Sox one was huge too. I was at game seven where the Red Sox just knocked the, the, the brakes off the Yankees in Yankee yeah. stadium. Those are two that like, I was at game seven, but then the Cubs, like if you respect sports and you respect the broadness of it, those iconic franchises of the Red Sox that had one of the best fan, still have one of the best fan bases, the Cubs, one of the best fan bases for their droughts to end in the fashion down three, one or down Oh three to the Yankees. The, those in basketball, I don't think there's a more iconic, but I think in sports, those are the two that I would kind of check and say, those those are on the Mount Rushmore also. I'll end with this one for you, Doris. Carson okay. Burke says, in her hooping prime, how does a best of seven horse series go between you and Stephen A? Oh, I haven't seen Stephen A's jump shot. Uh, <laughs> oh, check it it's out. not bad. It's not, it's not bad. It's not, not it's bad. Not, well, got a little, it's like a prettier versions of Sean Marion's. <laughs> <laughs> I was right about that, though, boy. That, that funky little flip. Well, and then you would be like, we live it. He'd be like, <laughs> yeah, and let him make one. And then he's I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking any trash against Stephen A. He's like the greatest in history at, at proclamation and declaration and debate. Seriously. <laughs> I agree. Yes. I agree. Um, yes. All right, Doris, you are wonderful. Um, yes. you know the how queen. Much you this is an honor to have you on our podcast. Um, just well, you know how much I miss you, Allie. I, I miss seeing you at games, and uh, uh, it was so much fun. I'm sure it took us so long to get to it, but I'm glad we did it. No, we oh, so awesome, Doris. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sure. You're the boss. Um, obviously, want to give a shout out to our friends over at Camus, um, alongside Channing. You will also extend your love to Doris, the chosen wines, but we do want to give our thanks to them. So we will be sending you a couple bottles. Um, uh, can't wait. I love Camus. Okay. Okay. Shout out. All right. That's another edition of Road Tripping.